Good afternoon. This meeting of the Finance and Member Services Committee is now being recorded for record keeping purposes. By participating in the session, you are consenting to the recording, retention, and future viewing of this meeting. This meeting is also now being live streamed. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Good afternoon. This is Mary Soderberg. I'm chair of the Finance and Member Services Committee. I would like to call the MIDI committee meeting to order at 1.02 on June 8th, 2021. Uh, Sarah McSurdy, can we have a roll call, please? Sure. Um, Senator DeSanto or is designee Mr. Erdman? Uh, this is Chuck Erdman for Senator DeSanto. Okay, thank you. Um, Chairman Philman? Here. Um, Representative Frankel or one of his designees? Uh, Dan Anko, designee present. Okay, thank you. Um, Chair Soderberg? Here. Here. Um, and then Secretary Vague or one of his Here. designees? Here. Is that Secretary Vague? Here. Okay, thank you. All right. Full attendance. Great. Um, a motion is in order to approve the minutes of the April 28th, 2021 Finance and Member Services Committee meeting. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second? Second from uh, Representative Frankel's designee. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Tim Carries, thank you very much. All right. This afternoon, we have an, an educational session followed by some um, um, office management updates. So there will be no votes this afternoon. Uh, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, representatives of Corn Ferry and Callan to give us an educational uh, session on the overview of the assumed rate of return actuarial assumption and its relationship to capital market expectations. So Sarah, is there anything more to introduce our, our guest? No, I think you covered it. And I think Chris Seach should be ready with his presentation. If you just want to give some verbal cues for when you want to progress your slides. Yes, thank you very much for having us today. Your first slide on the screen. Yes. Um, so, so as you introduced, we will be covering educational background related to the investment return assumption, which is yes. one of the key assumptions used. Um, if, if others can please go on mute. Um, one of the key assumptions used for the actual evaluation that ultimately determines the employer contribution rates. If we can jump forward a couple slides to the table of contents. There it is. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, so we'll, we'll have an introduction, again, uh, focused mainly on the purpose of the assumption, what it is. Then we'll walk through the assumption setting process and give some information on historical performance and benchmarking of the assumption compared to some peer retirement systems, as well as the sensitivity that the assumption has to the future contribution needs of the system. Then I will turn it over to Jay Klepfer from Callan to discuss some forward-looking capital market expectations. So uh, what the investment environment is like currently and, and what we expect moving forward. If we can move forward two slides. Excuse me, Chris, before you get um, too far started. Could I just remind everybody that the material is also in board docs under agenda item 5A? Okay, th thank you, Sarah. So the future benefits that will be paid from the system are unknown, right? We don't know when members will retire. We don't know how long the pe benefits will be paid for. We don't know exactly how long the members will live. And we need to make a lot of assumptions about the future, our expectations related to all of that. And we generally separate the assumptions by economics, so things related to things like investment, inflation, and demographic, which is assumptions related to uh, participant behavior. So again, the life expectancies when members will retire. And all of these assumptions are set by the SERS board. 
and they are based on recommendations provided by the consultants. Uh, so Corn Ferry on the actuarial side and Callan on the investment advisory side. If we can move forward. The investment return assumption, again, is a key forward-looking assumption. It is meant to estimate the long-term average investment return. It's used to discount the value of the benefit payments. So when we make all these assumptions as to what the benefits will be, we need to say what will the invested assets earn over time so that we can determine the present value of those benefits. We can discount those future benefits back to today and determine a, a present value for that. Uh, it also determines the system's funded position, so the funded ratio and the contribution needs, so the employer contribution rates. And something that's key to keep in mind throughout this discussion is that it is a long-term assumption. It is related to a budgeting tool for the contributions to help establish a contribution pattern. And that every time we conduct an actuarial evaluation, it does adjust for the differences between the actual and expected performance. So although we're doing this forward-looking, um, we are chewing up along the way. You know, we, we do reflect what actually happens in the markets and the actual fund values. So if we can move forward to the next slide. The investment return uh, has a few different components that kind of come all together to come up with one specific assumption. Uh, first of all, there's an underlying assumption related to inflation, so that's just general increase of the price of goods over time. And then there are the expectations related to real returns. So that excess return above just the general inflationary increases that are related to the individual investment classes. And also included in the overall assumption is a time horizon. So again, we, for the actual evaluation and in setting this assumption, we want to look over a very long horizon because we will be discounting future benefits um, for 30 plus years over, over kind of a, a longer 30 plus year horizon, which in many cases for capital market assumptions, when they're looking at current investment markets, um, the time horizon may be much shorter, maybe closer to five or 10 years when they're doing a expectation for kind of short-term performance. And because of differences in all these components, there can certainly lead to different investment return assumptions or possibilities, kind of a range of potential outcomes. If we can move forward. So again, the now kind of stepping back, the purpose of this assumption is to be used as a budgeting tool to help establish a long-term reasonable expectation for the value of the benefits and to help develop a actually determined contribution, which is the employer contribution rates. The ADC and the evaluation work together to help ensure that assets will be available to pay the benefits when due to the members. Um, it's related to the long-term sustainability of the plan and it's meant to be a um, reasonable expectation over the future that can be adjusted. If we move forward to slide eight. So again, the ADC is the process that's used to set the employer contribution rates. And the purpose is to create a relatively stable, relatively predictable pattern of contributions. So the contribution rates need to adjust over time to reflect what's actually happening, but we can use mechanisms um, to smooth that and adjust that such that we do, again, have that relatively stable and predictable pattern. We set reasonable expectations and we review them over time. And again, each valuation will always adjust to the differences between what actually happened and what we expected to happen. We can move forward to slide nine. Uh, slide nine provides a table of historical contribution amounts. As you can see, the contribution amounts have increased substantially over time. Uh, 2020 shown at the bottom of the chart, the uh, composite employer contribution rate was 33.76%. 
it's important to keep in mind that th this is just an aggregate rate. Each employer pays based on their membership classes of, of their enrolled members. And some employers actually pay much higher contribution rates because some classes uh, representation in some classes have su substantially higher contribution rates. So in total for 2020, uh, the actually determined contribution was just over $2.1 billion. And the actual contribution received of uh, $3.1 billion, the excess was due to the advanced funding that, were, that was received from Penn State. And as we look back, um, from 2015 and prior, we do see that the actual contribution amounts were less than the actually determined contribution. That was related to the Act 120 collars. And you can see um, during that period and then following is when the employer contributions increased substantially. We can move to slide 10. We're going to discuss the assumption selection process. We move on. So again, the, the SERS board sets the assumptions, but they look to especially the investment advisor and the actuary to provide recommendations and considerations in setting those assumptions. The investment advisor generally provides forward-looking um, expectations, what the capital markets are doing and expected to do over time. They also quantify risk profile of the asset allocations. So the assets in which the fund invests. The actuary provides kind of a, a comprehensive um, look at the needs of the plan, the future liabilities of the plan, and quantifies the funding status and the budget impact of any potential changes. The actuary can also look at a reasonable range of recommendation. And again, just quantify the effects of these changes. The, the board then will review the information and make a final decision on the assumptions. Move to the next slide. So these assumptions, especially the investment return assumption, is pretty much continually reviewed throughout the year by the board and, and especially by this committee. So if we move to the far right side of the timeline, that is the December 31, 2021 actual evaluation that will be determining the employer contribution rates beginning July 1, 2022. So that's the next valuation, um, and that is what we are trying to decide we should have a basis and a um, expectation for during this meeting. So in trying to establish the assumption and the kind of investment return expectations for the July 1, 2022 employer contribution rates. That process actually began back in September of 2020 when the stress testing and risk assessment report was prepared by Corn Ferry and presented to this committee. And then uh, as we move through to April of this year, we finalize the December 31, 2020 valuation. Um, and that's what we use as baseline for projections so that we have the best, most up-to-date uh, estimates for the upcoming fiscal year. If we can move forward to slide 13. So again, in September, what we did was we delivered the stress testing and risk assessment report. And included in that was um, information on the likelihood of attaining future investment returns. Um, we worked with the SERS investment advisor, Callan, as well as uh, we also received information on investment liquidity from the SERS investment office. So within this, we wanted to say, what is the likelihood of attaining certain uh, investment returns over time and what would be the impact on the budget related to attaining those um, investment returns. If we move to slide 14. So then again, in April, we completed the 2020 actual evaluation. And right now, that's what we're using as the basis for all of our contribution and budget projections moving forward. During June and July, 
the Finance and Member Services Committee meets to review investment performance, um, considerations from the actuary and from the investment advisors, and also review the capital market expectations. After this review, the Finance and Member Services Committee selects a uh, investment return assumption that is then recommended to the full SERS board. And uh, subject to the approval of the SERS board, that investment return assumption is what will be used for the December 31, 2021 valuation. And again, what will serve as the basis for determining the employer contribution rates beginning July 1, 2022. Then moving forward from there, we kind of continue the process moving right into the next year by using this latest updated assumption for our projections and for completing the 2021 stress testing and risk assessment report. If we can move to slide 15. So this current process, as you can see, has multiple steps. And what it does is it allows the committee and the board to focus on the decision-making process without um, worrying about the effect on current budget. So it allows detailed discussion, it allows time for review, it allows time for communication to the employers so that um, the budget impact and the, the effect on the contribution needs from those employers can be adequately communicated. And then, of course, it also allows us to reflect that in the risk assessment and the stress testing. We can reflect updated expectations. So following this process over the last few years, the, the board has decided to reduce the investment return assumption to 7.125 in 2019, so around this time of 2019. And then around this time last year, the board decided to re further reduce the investment return assumption to 7%. And the 7% is what was used for the 2020 valuation. If we can move forward to slide 16. So actuaries follow standards of practice that are referred to ASOPs. And there is ASOP 27 that provides guidance on selecting an investment return assumption and also for actuaries providing recommendations related to uh, selecting an investment return assumption. ASOP 27 states that the assumption should consider the purpose of the measurement. So again, the long-term budget planning uh, related to making sure that we have adequate contribution patterns. Reflect the actual assets in the portfolio. So the assumption should reflect the assets in which SERS is invested in, the asset allocation. Uh, estimated future ex expectations. So again, that's why it's important that we do look at these capital market expectations that, that Jay will be covering. And that it reflects any underlying components, including, of course, a, a long-term expectation related to inflation. The ASOP uh, guidance is also very clear that there can be a range of reasonable assumptions. It is not a, a one specific assumption. Again, we, we cannot accurately predict what's going to happen in the future. There is a kind of reasonable range. If we can move to slide 17. So reasons why there will be a range is, again, we don't know what will happen in the future. Um, there is a lot of volatility, especially in investment markets, even day to day, let alone year to year and valuation to valuation. Uh, the, there's often not a consensus among professionals as far as what will happen and how uh, certain things will impact the investment returns looking forward. There's also, as, as we talked about, there may be differences in the time horizon between what kind of that the short term expectations are and the long term nature of the pension plan and the long term nature of the benefits that are paid. So th there really can't be a single number uh, to decide on that that would that would be a, a, a sole quote unquote correct answer. Uh, we also know that, of course, the assumption will be changing over time. Our expectations are changing. The world is changing very rapidly. Uh, and, and this is common. Uh, it is also possible that there can be 
planned changes moving into the future. So you can you can plan to have a investment return for this year, as well as build in plans for that to be changing over time. So, uh, for example, a certain number of basis points reduction in upcoming future years. The guidance does allow for that as long as each one of those planned um, investment return assumptions are considered to be reasonable at that measurement date. So as long as the current assumption is reasonable, you can plan to make changes in the future as well. If we can move to slide 18. So uh, historical performance we can see here is provided uh, the basically middle columns show the nominal, which is the, the total investment return, as well as the real investment return. So that's net of the inflation for that year that was provided. When we look at what the investment return assumption is currently 7%, that is the nominal. So that's that total expected investment return. And what, what we can see on this slide is there is a lot of volatility year to year. Um, it is difficult to determine an average when there is this much volatility. We see as low as um, uh, negative 8% return, negative 11% return back in 2001 and 2. Of course, we saw a, a negative 28.7% return for 2008. Um, but then recently, we've seen very strong returns, including 11.1% uh, during 2020. If we move to slide 20. Slide 20 provides um, some, some averages related to that. So again, if, if we look um, over a five-year period, this is that third column, the average return was 9.1%. Uh, the average return was 8% over a 10-year period, 6.5% over a 15-year period, and 6.4% over a 20-year period. So if we look at... Um, how the returns compare to our assumption in individual years, we'll see that the, the actual returns did exceed our assumption in two of the last three years, three of the last five years, five of the last 10 years, and 12 of the last 20 years. So again, the, one of the key takeaways is that there is a lot of volatility year to year. We, we do know that um, over short periods such as uh, single years or five, ten years, we do expect to see a lot of volatility in the returns. If we can move to slide 21, this provides a graphical representation. So the, the red line kind of through the middle is the investment return assumption. And it is, uh, there are labels for when that was adjusted. So beginning in 2012, the expectation was reduced to 7.5%. And we can see reduced to 7.25% in 2017, 7.125% in 2019, and 7% in 2020. Uh, the light blue line provides the rolling 10-year average. So it's the 10 years ending as of that year. Um, so, so that's how we can see this, um, you know, a 9.1% uh, that we had seen before. So, uh, and then the blue bars represent the actual return for each year. So again, we can see the volatility of the returns and even the volatility in the 10-year average uh, dipping down below 5% uh, in the 10 years ending 2017 and, and coming up quite a bit higher by 2020. If we can move to uh, slide 22. So there has, again, um, as we saw in the last slide, been a clear trend toward lower investment return expectations. And this provides, again, the history of when SERS reduced the investment return assumption. This trend is, is not unique to SERS. It is, it is widespread throughout many large public sector retirement systems. And if we move to slide 23, uh, this shows, uh, as you can see along the bottom, total systems that were included in the NASRA, which is the National Association of State Retirement Administrators survey on large public retirement systems. 
Uh, each column represents uh, a period of in time when the survey was conducted. And then uh, each row represents a range of investment return assumptions. And the highlighted yellow is where SERS fell within that. So you can see, um, obviously, the reduction over time for SERS. And as you look at the numbers, you can see how there are more and more plans at a lower uh, investment return assumption. Personally, I think this can be more clearly seen on the next slide. So, so this slide has a lot going on on it, but a lot of really good information. So again, each column represents a year in which the survey was conducted. Uh, so from 2001 on the far left-hand side, all the way up to the most recent in 2021 on the far right-hand side. And the colors represent a investment uh, return and the um, prominence of that investment return assumption. So if we focus on the bold blue columns, that represents a investment return assumption of 7.5%. So if we, again, look all the way to the left, we can see what that means is about 20% of plans use an investment return assumption of 7.5% or less, because the column uh, is the distribution of the uh, return assumptions. So you can see that blue line and everything under it, the blue bar and everything under it, growing and growing throughout uh, this time period. And by the time we get to the most recent survey of in 2021, the the blue the the bold blue is toward the top of the chart, and you can see about maybe 90% of plans are now at 7.5% or less. So from 2001 through 2021, you, you see that 7.5 or less go from maybe 20% of plans to almost 90%. Um, and you can see that that large white uh, that represents an 8% investment return assumption back in 2001 uh, is just about off the chart in 2021. Um, the blue line through the middle represents the median. So that would be uh, the assumption in which half of the plans are above and half them are below. So again, back in 2001, the median was 8%, um, whereas now in 2021, the median uh, is labeled at 7%. You can see that when SERS, uh, the assumptions used by SERS are shown in these stars, so where the SERS assumption fell during each of these sur surveys. Uh, when the assumption was reduced from 8% down to 7.5%, which occurred in 2014, uh, SERS moved to below the median. So the assumption used by SERS has been below the median of these peers since 2014. Um, again, moving from 7.5 uh, down to 7.25, 7.125, and now the current assumption of 7.0. We can move to slide 25. Now we're going to discuss the sensitivity um, of the investment performance and the effect on the funded ratio and the contribution needs of the plan. So th the first thing we wanted to introduce is the difference between the effect of the actual investment performance, so what will actually happen in the markets, and the difference between that and the effect of changes in the assumption. So there's a difference between the assumed rate and the actual performance. So first we'll discuss the effect of the actual performance. Uh, each year we look at what actually happened and we compare what actually happened to what we expected to happen. And to the extent there's a difference, so any uh, investment related gains or losses between what we would have expected are recognized over a period of five years. And what that does is it helps smooth uh, the effects of investment performance. It helps dampen the volatility of the uh, volatility that we see in the markets. And then any changes in that unfunded that are related to the investment performance are amortized uh, and flow through to affect the employer contribution rates over a period of 30 years. If we can move forward to slide 27. 
So slide 27, the um, projected effects of investment performance. So the, the bluish line, which is uh, generally low, the lowest line across the entirety of the graph, uh, represents the baseline. So this is the expected future employer contribution rates, um, assuming that we earn 7% in all future years, so the current assumption. The red line, the line that is higher, assumes that in, rather than earning 7% in each year, the fund would earn only 6%. So as you can see, if the investment performance is unfavorable and comes in at only 6%, the employer contribution rates will be higher because less money coming from the investments means a, a larger cash need to go into the plan. However, as you can see, it's, it's a rather um, still rather steady as far as what the, the increases are, the difference between the blue line and the red line. Um, and as you can see, as projected, even if the fund only earned 6% during this period, the employer contribution rate is still expected to decrease from the current levels over time. So we, we would not see as rapid of a decrease, we would not see as much of a decrease, but it would still be expected to decrease over time. Can I ask a question, or would that be inappropriate right now? Um, how about, can we please finish um, the next couple slides, yep, and no then problem. I All think right, maybe we'll take a quick break for sure. some questions. Is that okay? Yep. Okay, thank you. So if we can move to slide 28. Slide 28 provides... Again, the same scenarios. So we have the baseline where we earn 7% in all years, and we have the, the, the unfavorable scenario of earning 6% in all years. And now we are looking at the effect on the funded ratio. So the comparison of the assets that are held in the trust to the expected value of the benefits. And, and again, we can see that um, even if there is that unfavorable performance of 6%, uh, the funded ratio is still expected to continue to increase. Um, so, again, it will not increase as rapidly, but it is still expected to continue to increase, even if there is unfavorable uh, performance. If we can move to slide 29. So, what we looked at in, in, in that scenario was the effect of actual investment performance. So that is each year we, we see what actually happens and it affects the, the funded ratio and it affects the contribution rates. Uh, slide 29 provides the effect of a change in the investment return assumption itself. So what a change in the assumption does is it says now we expect um, kind of that, you know, quote unquote underperformance to occur in all future years, and it recognizes the value of that, that difference between uh, what you would have expected, for example, 7%, um, and that new expectation, for example, 65 or 6%. It takes the entire uh, value of, of that difference and, and adds that to the liability uh, right away. It, it reflects that in the assumption and the expected value of the benefits. And then as far as the effect on the contribution rates, uh, that change in the unfunded liability is amortized over a period of 30 years and results in an immediate increase in the employer contribution rates. So right now, if we, if we look at the baseline, uh, again, the, the aggregate employer contribution rate is 33.76%. Um, that would increase to 37.04% if the if the assumption was reduced to 6.5% and would further increase up to 40.46% if the investment return assumption uh, was reduced to 6%. So you, you can see it is a very large increase that would happen. Um, we also provide the effect on the contribution amount. So the, the uh, expected contribution amount of 2.17 billion would increase to 2.39 billion at 6.5% or $2.62 billion at 6%. In, in, in general, what we see is about $150 million 
uh, per 25, uh, 0.25, 25 basis points um, decrease in the assumption. So each about 25% uh, decrease in the assumption is about uh, $150 million. And then the, of course, cu cumulative effect since that increase would be paid each year over a period of 30 years, kind of that 30 year number would be about 4.5 billion. So there would be about 4.5 billion in additional contributions made related to um, each 25 basis point reduction in the investment return assumption. Uh, and then fi finally, the last two show the amount of the unfunded liability and the funded ratio at, again, the baseline 59.4% um, would reduce down to 55.9% at a 6.5% assumption and 52.5% at a 6% assumption. Um, of course, again, it would, once that adjustment is made, it would over time be expected to increase over time as the contributions come in. That funded ratio would, would still be expected to be increasing over time. Um, at, at this point, would the group like to pause for a few questions or would you like to continue? Uh, Mary, I can see you talking, but you're currently muted. My apologies. Okay. Uh, are we about to turn over to Callan? Correct. Okay. Yes, we can open it up for some questions. Let's keep it brief, though. We've got a lot more slides to go through. I just kind of had one, or maybe it's more of an observation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know I'm close to my finish line here, so uh, take it for what it's worth. But the the uh, one of the things I've always wrestled with is when you look at what it means to miss your return assumption, say graphs 27 and 28. We look at those numbers and we kind of say, well, there's you know it's five percent here, it's five percent there. What it really means is you know you had the potential of missing your your kind of modeled assumption set, so what you're basically telling people the reality of the world is, by something like 30 percent. And I think that's a, uh, you know, in most budgeting exercises or anything else, when you miss a budget number by 30 percent, it's, it's a pretty big deal. And I think, uh, and it's even worse when you think about the liability, because the liability is just a, a bigger number, right? And those, those 30 percent just on this chart on, in front of me, uh, you know, a 1 percent difference today is a half a million dollars if that if we waited and we're just wrong, kept it at seven it actually became six and that loss compounds through time that that half a billion gets much bigger um, so these dollar amounts even though the percentages seem small the dollar amounts get quite large and um, <clears throat> that that's just one of the things I've noticed through time as we sit here and we talk about what really are underwriting standards um, that it's the percentages are easier to take, but uh, when you miss it over a period of time, all of a sudden the dollar amounts are what really become the problem. And, and so that's just one perspective I thought I'd throw out there. Okay, thank you. Okay, Chris, you want to continue? Oh, yes, Greg. yes. Greg, and, and you thank you for those comments. And and again, over periods of time, we we will. I think continue to have periods of time where we have favorable performance um, and, and we're above as, as we've seen over the last five to ten years. Um, and we'll have periods of time where if we go back a few years to the, during those five to ten years, we're, we're underperforming. Um, and I think we all agree that there will continue to be a lot of volatility, uh, that there won't be a consistent 7 percent or 6 percent or 5 percent. It will be very uh, a lot of volatility in those year to year returns. Yeah. So that's that's a good point, Chris. And you know, as we all know, this is not really a budget exercise. It's a projection exercise. And I was surprised that we came in um, over the past 20 years, 12 times ahead. So of our expectations. So it's very interesting. Uh, Greg, you had a question? Uh, yes, yeah. so I was just wondering, um, this chart here on Whatever page we're on here, 29 or whatever, where it shows where the contribution rates and the contributions are from the effect of making a change in the assumption. What do those look like if you 
project them out 20 years like you did on charts 27 and 28? Where does the contribution rate end up out there compared to what the current projections are at 7%? Well, again, it, it would still be expected to decrease over time um, because of what will be happening. So, so again, I, I think the focus during this session is more on the sensitivity. So, what, you know, what is the sensitivity to these changes? Um, during our next meeting, I think we can look a little more in depth on the actual effect on budgets and, and budget forecasting. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that is certainly some information that we can include in uh, the next committee meeting. Okay. And just to clarify, uh, I think you said for each 25 basis points reduction in the rate, it's estimated it would be uh, $4.5 billion in additional cost over the amortization period. Is that right? C correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. It, it, yes, about $4.5 billion over 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 a 30 year period okay thank you okay thank you chris it's all yours again all right i'm going to turn it over to, to jay okay all right uh good afternoon everybody um if we could turn to yes there we go one more slide please <clears throat> no one more after that <laughs> thank you uh i realize this is quite a bit of an eye chart i'm going to spend some time on this slide and walk you through a couple of thought processes and then we'll get to talking about your particular plan and our expectations for it going forward. Uh, Callan does capital market expectations every year. We release them in January. They're 10 years forward looking. They're really for investing across what we like to think of as at least one cycle. So think about this as a, a period where there'll be at least one drawdown, perhaps two. There'll be at least one recession, maybe two. And we're trying to come up with a 10 year compound return over that period. Um, they are informed by history, but that we don't let that be the tail that wags the dog. They're informed by recent valuation, but also don't let that be the tail that wags the dog. But let me talk through how unique this particular year was looking forward very quickly. So underneath this all, we do have a couple of uh, guides, things that help guide us in our projections. First, we have a bias toward long run averages. Doesn't mean we'll actually get there. But over the very long term, we're going to be moving in that direction. We have to get there over the next 10 years. Second, we have a conservative bias. Third, we believe there are risk premiums to be had by taking on investing in risky assets. Um, and we presume that markets will clear and they'll ultimately be rational. Now, they can be not cleared and irrational for an extended period of time. But we believe over the longer term, these tenants will basically hold. Uh, we also believe there's a long-term equilibrium relationship between capital markets and lasting trends in economic growth. And we try to drive, uh, pull that through all of our expectations. Um, we build this on a basis of a couple of different models that help inform our, our analysis. One is a bond model that we, you know, we have to start out with an assumption for inflation and an assumption for where we are with current interest rates and where they will go over time and what will drive growth underneath that. So a bond model, a path to interest rates and inflation, a cohesive economic outlook, and then a framework that helps knit it all together. So having said all that, you know, how does this process, how did this process work? Um, we always say we don't want you know, what just happened to be a tail that wags the dog and looking out over 10 years. But last year was a really remarkably different year in the capital markets. And frankly, I would argue looking forward we're in an, in an uncertain environment that none of us in this room have faced before. All, uh, it, with all our years of investment experience or just living experience, this is an unusual time looking forward. So when we hit the pandemic in March last year, the Fed moved back to a zero interest rate policy, complete reset for the fixed income market. Um, incredible amount of stimulus, both monetary and fiscal, we went through the deepest recession in 75 years, and then we went through one of the strongest recoveries that I've ever seen. Um, so while we started the year last year with concerns about high valuations, we went through this giant chasm known as the pandemic and, its, and our response. We came back out the other end with even more richly valued assets. So what does that mean going forward? So that's really helping to inform our expectations. So we had to reset our fixed income expectations. We had to revisit our equity expectation 
especially relative to fixed income, what's our premium that we expect, and then refine and confirm any suggested changes or advantages for diversifying assets. All right, so that, that's really the long way of saying you know, this is one of the years we probably made some of the biggest changes we've ever made. So starting at the bottom of this page, if you look, we'll start with inflation. What's our expectation? It's 2% looking forward. Now, given what's just happened in the market the last couple of months, you might think, well, that's a little low. But I'm looking back over a longer period of time. In effect, we haven't been able to get to 2% on a compound 10-year basis for quite some time. I believe the numbers that you see now for inflation, so it was like over 4% in April, or not in April, um, in uh, May, I guess it was May, April, May, I think those are the two numbers we've got. So these numbers that are causing lots of concern, headline numbers, they're just that, they're headline numbers. Think about it, last year when the pandemic hit and demand stopped, inflation fell sharply. So just getting back to the price levels we were once at is giving us this, this boost. Second, there's a lot of dislocation in supply chains amongst you know the, uh, surges in demand, distortions in demand due to stimulus and um, you know extended unemployment benefits and also the other distortions the other way with people losing jobs. I mean, we're at 9 million in the hole still from the pandemic. And then global dislocations. So looking around this chasm, the economic data is not so clear and you want to be very careful how you read it. Looking forward, we think there's a really good chance you'll see these kind of numbers repeat over the next few months of three, four, five percent inflation, and then they'll die right back down. So we're comfortable with our 10-year expectation of 2% compound. The Fed has given lots of guidance that that's their goal, and that they will run and let inflation run hot so we can even get to that kind of an average. So that's inflation. Now you move up to cash. Only 1%. I mean, right now cash is essentially zero. So over a 10-year period, how do you get to one? Rates will have to rise. They're already rising now on the markets by themselves. The Fed has indicated they will likely start raising rates next year or the year after. We believe it'll be next year. It'll be sooner rather than later. Um, but even so, that's a negative return relative to, to, to inflation. So that column that says real return, uh, we've, we've only, I think only once in my history at Calendar have we had a negative real return for cash. Now you look up into the middle part of the table where it says fixed income. Core fixed income, the broadest representation, 175 is our expectation for a compound return over 10 years. That doesn't even keep up with inflation. So first time in my experience that we've had a compound return for you know a broad fixed income market that doesn't keep up with inflation. So very low, and again, we're starting with very low yields. We do expect rates to rise, which means you actually lose money in fixed income while the rates are rising. You collect a higher yield on the other end but it's going to average out at below 2%. Then we move up to the top part of the table in equity and a couple of things going on. Let's look at large cap. That's a sort of a good anchor. 6.5% compound return, which is a 4.5% real. So how does that compare to long-term history? It's low. So we're expecting, you know, built into our equity expectation is that equity is pricey. We don't typically make too many valuation adjustments, but we did this year. We brought a compound 25 basis points per year over the next 10 years down because of the valuation process. We also build on top of that then what's the return on free cash flow, primarily dividends, what's the return associated with growth in earnings, and then what, how do you gross that up to be a nominal return? So 6.5% for equity, 175 for fixed income. You can see some of the, the real assets in the middle of the table. They typically lie between stocks and bonds. Um, <clears throat> and then private equity down uh, further below, or in the top part of the table is our highest returning asset class. But if you look down that column of 10-year compound returns, there's not many that are over 7. So it's even just getting to 7% on the next 10-year forward-looking basis is going to be a challenge. And that's really been the reset in the capital markets looking forward. So and we're not alone in this set of expectations. If anything, we're probably a little bit more sanguine than others. Um, I, it's not unusual to see expectations of equity for 5% in fixed income even below our 175. I think those are overstated, frankly. But that's the backdrop in which we've helping to develop these sets of expectations. So reset in the fixed income market, 
rich valuation in both equity and fixed income, an expectation for a modest rise in interest rates starting next year or the year after, which is also going to hamper somewhat in, uh, uh, the fixed income expectation. And we have 175 and six and a half sort of as the guideposts for bonds and stocks. Okay. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, we just have the picture of the, cat, the correlation table. I won't go through much detail there. Um, but it, suffice it to say, it's one of the key elements of combining return and risk. If we go to one more slide, please, which is 34, uh, it's just a summary of what changes did we have to make on our 10-year forward-looking expectations. Um, so the, the biggest changes from what I spoke to a year ago when I was in, um, I guess we did, this was electronically last year too, didn't we? Uh, cash returns down by 1%. So we were at 2% last year. Now we're at one going forward. Uh, core fixed income, we were at 275 a year ago. Now we're down to 1%, uh, 175. And then public equity returns are down between 45 and 55 basis points. So in, in some sense, we actually widened the risk premium for equity over both cash and fixed income. We think that'll be reflective of investors' desire to try to reach for return. But you know, there's more than four times the volatility in equity than there is in fixed income. Um, and then there's just some other minor adjustments that you see depicted on, the, on this page here. Um, if you turn to page 35, please, uh, this has been a long-term trend toward lowering return expectations. Chris spoke of this when you showed you the NASRA data. Um, and these are our capital market expectations by asset class, all the way back to 1991. So you can see um, the top one is broad U.S. equity. The bottom one is inflation. The teal color is fixed income. So you can see where the other asset classes line up. So we actually had in interest rates rising. I don't know if everybody remembers this, but after we decided to get out of the taper, start raising interest rates, started in 2000, no, mid part of 2017, into 18, but we halted that process in 2019. And then we hit the, the pandemic last year, so we brought expectations back down. Um, associated with that, if you go two more slides ahead, please, to slide 37. This is really the heart of the message that we've had to convey to many people. Um, Think of this, uh, this is a, a very interesting thought exercise. And I, I've sh I think I've shown you this before, but let me please explain it again one more time. If you look on the rightmost pie chart, if you come to us and say, I need 7% return, what would a portfolio with your expectations look like? And it's almost all growth assets. Just 3% fixed income, large allocation to private equity and to, and to private real estate, and everything else equity. So it doesn't even like some of the real assets because the returns just aren't quite there to get you where you need to go. And then an incredibly high volatility. And then this thought exercise is, well, what if you'd come to Callan 15 years ago and we had 10 year expectations at the time then, what would, what would we have told you in 2006? Well, we would have told you you could have got where you needed to go at 7% with two thirds of in fixed income. 30 years ago, we would have told you you could get there with cash, almost all cash. Because in 1991, our return expectation for cash was 6.8. So this has been a, you know, a steady increase in complexity and risk-taking required to get a targeted return that looks something like 7%. So you are not alone. Every one of our investors is facing this particular challenge as we look forward. Now, if we can move uh, two more slides ahead to slide 39. Let's take this through to the uh, new uh, Pennsylvania SERS target portfolio. So Seth provided us with this new target that we're working from now, um, and the board has approved. You can see the allocations to large, small cap, the new allocation of micro, covered call strategies, and then developed the international equity markets, and then the other asset classes, and then the retooling of the fixed income market, or the, the fixed income market. Sorry, could somebody please pause? I'm hearing a lot of road noise. Or mute, please. Yes, thank you. Um, so if we take Callan's expectations that I just showed you, and with all the, 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 the various detail for each of these asset categories, our 10-year compound return expectation is 605. If you adjust it for inflation, it's 405. Now, note that this does not include any assumption for active management. Clearly, 
asset classes. Um, you have active management throughout the portfolio, but also the private markets were trying to give you a representational result for like private equity and for some of the real assets and private credit. But you know, it, it's a subdued expected return looking forward over 10 years. And that's really part of, I mean, Chris hinted at this when he looked at, um, showed you information over history as well. There can be extended 10 year periods where the returns are relatively slow, low, and then other extended periods where the return, the 10 year periods are high. And remember, you're trying to fund out over a longer term period. This is really just, our focus is on 10 years because we're more on the investment side. So the last couple of slides I'll leave you with, and then we can I'm glad to entertain questions is, well, we went through this exercise of, well, what's the, what's the range of potential outcomes with this particular target and over a one year, a five year, and a 10 year period? And then what's the chance that you could actually get to different projected target returns? So if you go to slide 41, I'm gonna skip slide 40 because it doesn't apply anymore, but slide 41, please. It shows uh, a, there's a 7% return. And the way to read this floating bar chart is in any given one year, there's a lot of volatility from the equity market. But over five years, and especially over 10, good years can cancel out bad years. And you get more sort of at the pure sort of beta exposure over a 10 year period for all the different components of the portfolio. So in a one year period, you know, because the, the range is very wide, there's a 47% chance you get the 7% return. Now 47 sounds low, but think about, um, the best, better way to think about it is the midpoint of this range is 50th percentile. So the median, the midpoint of the range, half of them are above, half are below. It's fairly close to a median result over one year. However, over five years, it's a little bit less chance of getting there. And over 10 years, it's more like a 40% chance of getting there. So you're in the sort of second quartile. If you move to the next slide, please, what's, what's, what happens to the probabilities if we lower the discount rate to say, or the target to 675, so drop it 25 basis points? Well, the probability over 10 years goes up a couple of percentage points. Uh, dropping it to six and a half, you get a little, it goes, it goes up a little bit better. If you go to the next slide, please, slide 43. Um, you're now at about 43 or 45% chance, getting close to the median. And then if you go to slide 44, which is 6% uh, return, well, that is the expected result with our given set of assumptions. So I, what I'm trying to do with these, these last couple of slides is give you a feel for probability because one of the beauties of using this framework is you get not only an expected return and risk and then the interaction of the asset classes, you get a range of potential outcomes and a probability of a specific target or a goal. So those are the, those are the some of my prepared remarks. Um, I'd be happy to discuss anything you'd like to discuss. And Jay, before you do one one thing, I would add that we're looking at the target, right? We're looking at the current asset allocation target, how that models out. You showed what it took to get a seven zero return. You showed the asset allocation with that. It's much riskier than the right. asset target today and the volatility is much higher so we've been talking about volatility of returns and how you can't know in any given year if you're going to hit say a seven percent target and that's tied to the risk you have to take in the portfolio so let's say you had a target of two percent which is more than cash but it's very attainable um, you're going to have a much lower volatility of returns so the higher the expected return the more you take risk to try and achieve that, the more volatility you're going to see in the return. So what Jay showed for the 7.0 mix, that has a standard deviation of 17%. The current target has a volatility of about 13. So we're, we're going out on the risk curve where it's relatively flat because our expectations are relatively low and you're taking more risk the, the more you try and reach for that level of return. So they're, they're tied together, and that's why you can't know in any given year if you're going to hit that seven. It's different than if you had a much lower expected return where the, the probability of hitting it is much higher, the volatility of the portfolio is much lower. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. Any questions, comments? 
Mary, I might throw one out if, if the board members uh, don't have any. If so, I'll wait until I'll wait until the end of the line. Okay, why don't we wait to see if there are any board members that have questions or comments? Go ahead. I, I just thought, after listening to this, I I just thought, you know, what 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 did it say to me? Um, and I think th there's a few things, maybe just from my time in the industry uh, when I first came in, the, these 50 percent targets were always exceeded because the portfolios we held were always expected to outperform the assumed rate of return of say 8 percent. Uh, interest rates were higher, and so seeing something that was 80 percent, 75 percent likely to beat the assumed rate of return wasn't wasn't odd. And so what you've seen in in the chart from Callen is that through time um, we've kind of let the 75 percent go to 70, go to 60, and now we're at 50. And what Callen's showing us at a 7 percent assumed rate of return today, with the portfolio we hold, we're 40 percent likely to hit the long, the 10-year target. Um, and I think that's, that, that continued reduction in the probability of achieving our goal is one of the underwriting problems with all public pension plans. Um, so paying attention to that matters. And then the other uh, observation I would make is if you look at the uh, bar chart that's being shown right now, um, just as a, a matter of illustration, um, when you're dealing with range of outcomes, it's, it's mostly what you're looking at is trying to be conservative within that range. Um, so if you kind of look at the, the red bar there, that would be, you know, that would be your conservative assumption. And that, that bar is probably somewhere, I can't read it from here, but it's around 3%. So that, that shows you what a conservative assumption would be given our portfolio. And, it's the, to me the trick here. It's 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 an art, not a science. Is trying to find a place in that range of outcomes where it's reasonably likely to occur, but you can also justify that you weren't overly ambitious in your return targets, uh, because in the end, if you're overly ambitious in, in the sense of taking too much risk and it doesn't work, we all kind of have seen how that water washes ashore. So. Um, you know, as, as you sit through and struggle with this, really the most critical pricing point you have in this in this annuity we have, um, this is this is a the biggest hardest um, decision that this board makes, and and to set out a a ethos or a culture of just kind of saying that, you know, what we want to do is we want to assume a conservative number in the range of outcomes, but we know we can't get there today. What sort of path do we need to get there? I think is the question, if I were you, that is the question I would be asking. And I would be putting Jim and Tom to work on coming up with ideas for how to do that. Thank you, Seth. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. This has been very interesting, very sobering. So, appreciate it. You're welcome. So, so th this is Chris Seats with Corn Ferry. Just a couple um, last comments is mm -hmm. that for the valuation, and again, for setting the ADC, we're trying to get relatively predictable, relatively stable pattern to the extent that we can. We want to adjust for what's happening in markets and over time. Um, but, but to say, use a investment return assumption that's at, say, that, that 75th percentile mark, um, like that was discussed, would not generally fall into a range of, um, of reasonable expectation. Uh, now, of course, it, it would be a reasonable conservative expectation, but of course that wouldn't, like we said, be a conservative approach. Um, what that would be doing for how the plan is funded and how the contributions are determined is it would it would conservatively increase the amount of cash that is uh, received by the plan now. It would result in a much higher contribution amount um, now in the hopes that you, you then um, over time are exceeding that expectation and 
uh, have gains and have lower contribution needs in the future. Um, what we would generally see is, uh, again, this is the capital market expectations and these ranges and probabilities are changing a lot over time. Um, even right now, we see a difference between um, the, the information that, that Jay was showing, which um, is based on a 2% inflation assumption, whereas the plan usually, uh, currently utilizes a 2.5% inflation assumption, and, and that's something we can talk about again at the next meeting as well. But so right there, you already see you know a, a pretty significant 50, 50 basis point difference. But what what we would generally see, and, and what we have seen presented by by uh, other professionals, is that the investment return assumption falls somewhere in a range of kind of that 35 to 65 percent range. Um, so that's not necessarily overly optimistic nor conservative. Um, it isn't necessarily pushing up um, the cash needs to now in the hope that things go down in the future, or it's, it's not um, you know, pushing it so that there's higher contributions needed in the future. Um, what we've seen is at the current levels, we do see that the contributions would still be expected to be decreasing over time. Um, so right now, it's, it's not apparent that it would be uh, directly pushing contribution needs into the future, um, you know, reliance on higher contribution levels coming in in the future, um, if that does make sense. So, so again, it, um, targeting something as high as that, that 75th percentile gives you a better chance of lower contribution needs in the future, but we want to make sure we're balancing that against, um, you know, the, the current contribution needs, the, the current budgets. So. Mary, I'd just throw one more thing out there before you, you kick me out of the room. But the uh, I've gotten a lot of flack over my years for counting for public pension funds Seth? counting counting Seth? the ch yes. Seth. Mr. Jordan, you had his hand up, please. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you, Mary. So uh, I'm trying to think about this. Either way, you know, if we maintain our current uh, earnings assumption of 7% and miss it by 50 basis points, or if we would lower our assumption uh, by 50 basis points to 6.5%, we're going to have increased costs either way. Um, am I correct that the only real difference is, is that if you maintain the current earnings assumption and miss it, the impact of the uh, way the losses are recognized and smoothed, that's what the different, the big difference is that if you, know, if you lower the rate, then your influx of new employer contributions into the fund is more immediate. Yes, that, that is correct as far as the impact. Um, of course, like we said, we, we do want to make sure that the assumption used is reasonable and does reflect our expectations. Um, so if, if they are decreasing, if, if we are consistently seeing lower um, forward-looking expectations, then, then that should be reflected. Um, sure. You know, it, it's not that you should just lock in one thing and keep it there forever for the next few years and say, oh, it'll just have a slower impact. Um, it, it, it's a more comprehensive uh, more robust analysis of, of kind of doing that and getting there over time. Yeah, okay. I was just trying to understand what the differences are, but I do, I do understand your point about uh, trying to keep the actuarial assumption uh, in line with what the true expectations and projections are. So thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been, you know, this is third year in a row that we have looked at our uh, rate and each year we've said it's very volatile and this year I think it really is very volatile as we all agree but this is only one year so this has been a very interesting discussion appreciate all of your comments so Mary, you have, a, make, brief, you have make, a brief point to make just very brief uh, the first one is to Greg Jordan's point if you wait to change, if you let the assumed rate of return be wrong, it's more expensive in the long term to fix. That's the first thing. The second thing is um, 
the, the biggest criticism of public pension funds that I see that sticks <clears throat> is that we count our chickens before they hatch. And I would bring up the Canadian model <clears throat> as the example of this, where they invest a lot like us, and they're oftentimes shown to boards like you as the epitome of how to invest. But the truth is the assumed rate of return is a bond yield. So they buy equities, but they assume bonds. And so what that allows is for their portfolio to outstrip their assumed rate of return, and therefore they are not counting their chickens before they hatch. The money is in the bank before they spend it. And I think that's the underwriting principle that would help public pension funds broadly. And that's it. Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, it's, well, no, this has been a good discussion. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Sarah? What is next on the agenda? Thank you, Mary. Um, in the essence of time, I'm going to try to go through the next two agenda items fairly quickly. The next one is in board docs under agenda item 6A. This is the Office of Financial Management update. I just wanted to provide uh, an update on some happening since the last meeting. If you go on to the next slide. Uh, the first item that I wanted to convey to the committee and the board is that the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education um, made a payment under their funding agreement. Um, the last time the board met, they approved the funding agreement. That agreement was finalized and um, by both parties and signed and PASHI made their one-time lump sum contribution of $825 million to our defined benefit plan towards their unfunded liability on April 29th, 2021. As mentioned in the investment committee, these funds are being invested according uh, to the investment policy statement, and they'll begin to use their annual set-off credits in this upcoming fiscal year. You can go to the next slide. Next, I'll give an update on the defi defined contribution plan per participant charge. Um, in Act 2020-23, which was enacted in May 29th of last year, authorized SERS board to assess all employers a per participant charge. On July 29th of last year, the board adopted a motion to implement this optional charge um, for fiscal year 2020, 2021, and then delegated the authority to determine, assess, invoice, and collect amounts to the secretary of the board and administrative staff. Our methodology remains consistent this year. Um, we divide the budget it needs for the defined contribution plans, administrative fees, costs, and expenses for the fiscal year. That are not covered by other sources of funds by the total number of active participants in um, Act 5 classes or membership in the defined contribution plan that are contained in the, the census that we certify to the board's actuary as of December 31st, 2020. The per participant charge for the fiscal year 2021-2022 is $165.64 per active participant. The Office of Financial Management staff will move forward and employers will be assessed this fee through the comptroller cost allocation process or we have some employers that we have to manually invoice. The charges or total bills will range from $165.64 to a high of $328,141.22. There's no action needed from the committee on this, but I did just want to inform you of the results. The initial year of implementation charge was higher at $668.77. The reduction in the current year is made possible by several factors. One is a lower budgeted amount. The second is cost savings initiatives that we're trying to pass through to the employers. The third is the ability to use unvested employer contributions, which were made possible by Act 2020-94, and then also a credit for unused funds from the previous year. So before I move on, I just want to quickly remind you that the defined contribution plan is still a young plan and only open for enrollment in January 1st, 2019. 
So it was uh, implemented in a very short amount of time. So we continue to evaluate the moving parts to see where efficiencies can be had. So if you go to the next slide. And just circling back, I wanted to convey that we received some awards on our 2019 um, annual comprehensive financial report. This report was previously referred to as the comprehensive annual financial report. One was for the Government Finance Officers Association and one was for the Public Pension Commission. Um, these are the highest form of recognition in the area of general accounting and financial reporting. They're longstanding traditions for CERS and we're currently working on finalizing our 2020 report. Um, I believe the 2020 report will continue to meet these standards and will apply for these awards when the reports are finalized. Do so you go to the next slide? And just a quick update on um, finalizing these, these reports. We um, completed our financial statements and also our um, we're working on our annual comprehensive financial report using Workiva, which is a financial statement preparation software. It's listed as a goal in the strategic plan. So we're coming up on completion of that goal. It's fundamentally changed and transformed the way our, takes, our work takes place in the Office of Financial Management, other CERS bureaus that help us out in the production, and also our external auditors, which gave us KPMG worked in this as well um, in obtaining support, tying out figures, um, and they gave us very good feedback. So this brings together everything we need into one platform, teamwork, integrated report files, data sources, support, and so we can work more efficiently. It allows for automation, streamlined review, and good communication and tracking features. We're also learning that we could use this for more deliverables than we originally planned to use it for. And the next two slides just give examples of what Workiva can do. I'm not going to go through them for the sake of time, but if anybody would like to learn more, you can certainly contact us and we'd be happy to show you anything that you would like. So um, that concludes the presentation. Are there any questions? Any questions of Sarah? Okay. Then we'll move on to the financial highlights. Sure. So I'm going to move on to agenda item 6B, it's the 2020 financial highlights. So as mentioned early in the audit risk and compliance meeting, the financial statements for 2020 have been prepared and audited by KPMG. KPMG issued an unmodified opinion. Um, I'm going to start out, if you can move to the next slide. I'm going to start out and give a highlight of the defined benefit plan, then move on to the defined contribution plan, and finally we'll touch on the deferred compensation plan. However, I do want to urge you that if you haven't looked at them already to look at the full publication of the statements for um, all of the um, basic financial statements and supplementary disclosures of MD&A and their footnotes and other disclosures that we have. You can go to the next slide. So first, I'm going to start with the defined benefit plan. Um, some plan highlights are, we've heard about this a couple times today. In April 2020, Penn State University paid their one-time lump sum contribution payment of $1.06 billion towards its unfunded liability. In return, the university will receive annual credit set-offs against its contributions over the next 30 years. Um, Penn State ended up using approximately $50 million of these credits in 2020. Um, this transaction was very large and unusual um, because there was no real clear GASB guidance that could be followed when determining how to account for this transaction. So a lot of research had to be done and work with KPMG to make sure that they were comfortable with how we were accounting for this, which they were. And um, this was recorded as a contribution, employer contribution in the current year on our financial statements. Um, 
Another key thing um, was the volatility in the financial markets, which was impacted by COVID-19. However, changes made to the CERS investment strategy and asset allocation in December 2019 helped yield the positive investment results for 2020. The full economic impact of the pandemic still remains uncertain. You go to the next slide. This is just a very condensed summary of our fiduciary net position statement. This is equatable to a balance sheet. As you can see, our net position for 2019 was approximately 31.1 billion, and it went up approximately 3.9 billion to 35 billion at the end of 2020. If you go to the next slide, you can see the changes in the net position. Um, the increases were driven by normal contributions and special one-time contributions from Penn State and the investment income outweighing the deductions from the plan. Um, just like I said, the previous statement is equatable to a balance sheet. The summary of changes in fiduciary net position is equatable to an income statement. Um, you can see the contributions year over year increased approximately $1 billion, and this is directly re related to the Penn State lump sum payment that we mentioned before. Um, the net investment income is a little bit lower than it was in 2020 than it was in 2019 due to lower investment returns. And the benefit payments were a little bit higher because there were more people on the annuity payroll and um, newer people that are added to the payroll have a higher um, annual, annual average uh, salary. So if you go on to the next slide. So this slide shows uh, the breakdown of the investment balances. Um, just to briefly discuss this, if you look at the pie chart, you can see mostly on the right-hand side that a majority of our investments are in liquid investments, such as the fixed income, common or preferred stocks, and then the commingled uh, fixed income and public equity, in addition to the short-term investments with um, a smaller portion invested in the less liquid um, private equity, real estate, and hedge funds. So you can go to the next slide. This slide shows the contribution highlights for the year 2020. You can see Penn State was the number one employer that we had for contributing to the plan. Um, once again, this is related to their one-time lump sum payment that they made. But then you can see the listing of the next larger employers that we have, which include corrections, human services, state police, transportation, state system of higher education, courts, labor and industry, executive office, environmental protection. And then um, we lumped together all of our other employers. In total, we have 102 employers with most of them being Commonwealth government or governor's agencies. You go to the next slide. This slide shows the pension payments um, that we make by county. Um, you can see that out of the um, nearly $3.6 billion in pension payments, uh, $3.2 billion went to Pennsylvania addresses. This is a pretty good um, large chunk, about 89%. Um, not only are these benefit payments going to residents of Pennsylvania, but there's also trickle-down effects that these payments have um, that improve the Pennsylvania economy. Um, the dark blue um, counties indicate the highest payments. They include Allegheny, Center, Luzerne, Montgomery, and then um, the highest two are Cumberland and Dauphin. If you can go up to the next slide. This, out of the presentation, I think this slide is the most informative slide. Um, it gives a a summary of what we just talked about, the contributions, investments, and benefits of the plan, and it gives a summary over the past 10 years. If you look at the top left-hand graphs, you can see that the three sources of funding are investment earnings, member contributions, and employer contributions outweigh the benefits and expenses out of the plan, which is the green block. If you look at the right-hand side, you can see that the benefits and expenses um, were more than double, though, the 
employer contributions that are coming into the plan. So this shows that we really need to rely on the investment earnings to help build up the fund. Then at the bottom, you can see um, all of those types of activity that either add to the fund or take away from the fund, um, noting that in 2011, the fund balance was about $24.4 billion. And now in 2020, we're at about $35 billion. So that's about 44% increase over those years, which is very good. Now, if you look at the benefit payments as a percent of the total net position, in 2011, those benefit payments, which were about $2.7 billion, were 11% of the net position. Now, today we're at a little bit more healthier status because the pension and benefit expenses of approximately $3.6 billion are about 10% of our net position. And just for um, just in case you're curious, in 2011, there were about 115,000 um, uh, beneficiaries receiving payment. And in 2020, there are approximately 133,000. Can you go to the next slide? I just want to briefly touch on the actuarial valuations. If you look in our financial statements, we show information on two um, actuarial valuations. The one is um, what's called a financial reporting or accounting valuation under GASB 67, and then the other one that is required um, by statutory purposes for determining employer contributions. The key difference between the two are the actuarial cost method and the asset valuation method. Um, the December 31st, 2020 valuations for both use the most um, current assumptions that were approved as part of the five-year experience study. You can see in the charts that the uh, accounting valuation produces um, a little bit more favorable results than the funding valuation. Um, under GASB 68, the financial reporting or accounting valuation is allocated out to uh, all of our employers using an allocated share methodology. Um, they get allocated a portion of the liability, pension expense, deferred inflows and outflows, and they record those on their financial statement. We're currently working on that reporting. It's getting finalized and that gets audited by KPMG before we release that to our employers. Should you go to the next slide? Now we're going to move on to the um, defined contribution plan. It's been an exciting year for this plan. Uh, we had a couple pieces of legislation that were passed that really helped us helped us out. The first was Act 2020-23, which authorized the per participant charge for administrative fees, costs, and expenses of the plan. Um, I already talked a little bit about that, so I'm not going to go into more detail. But then Act 2020-94 was passed. And this retroactively allowed the plan to use unvested employer contributions occurring after June 30th, 2020 to offset administrative costs to the plan. Um, the plan also completed its second full year of operations and it continues to grow. You go to the next slide. Once again, this is just a small summary of our fiduciary net position. Most of our assets are the investment accounts of our participants. Uh, the net position increased about $28 million year over year. You can go to the next slide. Um, the increase year over year was mainly due to contributions, investment earnings, and funding from employers exceeding deductions from the plan. You go to the next slide. On this slide, uh, we're showing a fund breakout of uh, balances in the plan. You can see that most of the investment the participants are choosing to invest in the target date funds makes up a majority of the balances. You go to the next slide. And this shows contributions by funds. So as you can expect, um, most of the contributions are going into the target date fund as well. Go to the next slide. So here we show a breakout of the target date funds. Um, 
you can see that participants are entered into funds based on their date of birth and their expe expected date of retirement. Um, the investment mix is changed as they come closer to their retirement date. Um, looking at the bar chart, the first bar chart on the right-hand side, you can see that there's a good mix um, between the different dates of target date funds that are on the menu. You can go to the next slide. Now, finally, we're going to cover our deferred compensation plan, which had an equally exciting year. Um, in the deferred compensation plan, um, we added the target date fund options as the default option in January 2020. Um, this offers the participants to um, easily invest their savings in a diversified portfolio that's risk adjusted to an age based glide path. Um, to do this, four investment options from 2019 were eliminated, uh, which were, we call these risk profile funds. Um, they were a 60 40 balanced fund, which was a stock and bond fund, as well as an aggressive, moderate, and conservative uh, risk based fund. Also, as you can remember, on April 3rd, 2020, the SERS board moved to allow COVID-19 related distributions consistent with the federal coronavirus aid relief and economic security act, which is the CARES Act. Um, this allowed deferred compensation participants to take an early distribution withdrawal on tax penalty on a tax penalty free basis from their accounts to meet their immediate needs with the option to repay the money within three years. Um, the withdrawals during 2020 totaled nearly $31 million. You go to the next slide. So again, the summary of the net position or balance sheet, it's mostly the assets are mostly um, the investments related to participants accounts um, year over year. Um, this went up about a half of uh, $482 million. You go to the next slide. You can see the increase is related, um, just like the defined contribution plan, related to contributions into the plan, plan transfers into the plan, and investment income outweighing the deductions from the plan. Um, one thing I'd like to uh, bring your attention to is the plan transfers out of the plan, which is closer to the bottom of the table. And you can see year over year, um, the plan transfers out of the plan have decreased um, about $24 million, which to me is a very good sign as saying that we're able to keep more money into the plan. And I think that is um, showing that this retirement services group is doing a good job um, keeping helping to keep money in the plan. And then if you could go to the next slide. And just like the defined contribution plan, we have a breakout of the fund balances. You can see here that the most popular um, choices for our participants are the stable value fund, which is a more conservative fund, um, the U.S. large company stock index fund, which is um, a little bit more moderate or high risk, and then also the target date funds, which are now the um, default option. Could you go to the next slide? And this slide just shows um, the contributions by fund. And just like the fund balances, as you would expect, most of the contributions are going into the stable value target date funds or the U.S. large company stock fund. You go to the next slide. We have a breakout of the um, different years of target date funds on here. Um, the defined contribution plan was more evenly spread out, but here you can see the target date funds are more heavily weighted to the top section, which means that their retirements have either passed, their ex expected retirements are either past or are coming up sooner rather than later. Um, approximately 43% of the target date fund participant balances um, are related to people that you would expect to retire in the next 10 years. And then the last slide is, um, I think earlier in the morning, Mary had mentioned, you know, how important the deferred compensation plan is. We all know that we're increasing 
um, the attention that we pay to it and trying to get the word out to all the participants because it is a very good plan. And um, this slide really shows how much the plan has grown over the past 10 years. Since 2011, assets have, um, assets have doubled and the participation has increased by approximately 7,300 participants. So I just wanted to say thanks to all of the staff that were involved with pre preparation of the financial statements and the audit. It was the first time through for, for many of them, and they did a very good job. Um, I know I shot through this pretty quickly, so um, it concludes the presentation, but I'd be happy to answer any questions now, or you can follow up with me separately. Okay. Th thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's been an amazing job over the last year and a half doing all of this remotely, but as many of you in the room know, we've had um, a lot of new people coming on board over the last year as well, and that, that creates a lot of, of pressures and, and training press points. So uh, good job. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, comments from anyone? Okay. This is Dan Alka, just well done. Thank you, Dan. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the 2020 Actuarial Valuation Report. All right, thank you, Mary. Um, I can be fairly brief. Uh, every year at the June meeting, the Actuarial Valuation Reports are made available to the board. Uh, as we have moved to an electronic distribution, uh, if you look under tab 6C, that's 6 Charlie, in board docs, you will find this year's reports. Uh, if there are any questions about the material once you've had a chance to dive into it and review it, please feel free to reach out directly to me, uh, and I will coordinate responses through Sir staff and Corn Ferry. Uh, Thank you. As far as the actuarial services contract goes, the services contract has a five-year term with the current contract expiring at the end of this month. Uh, because ongoing contract negotiations with the selective bidder um, are not yet finalized and, and, quite frankly, are very sensitive, I'm not at liberty to discuss any of the details at this time. However, I wanted to take the opportunity uh, to assure the members of the board uh, that SERS is on track to have actuarial services secured for another five-year period, commencing, commencing at the conclusion of the current contract without any gap in support. Uh, and honestly, it's, a, it's an arduous process, um, and I wanted to, to recognize, quickly recognize a few staff members from executive staff Sarah McSurdy and Karen Lynn, and from the administrative staff uh, Don Miller and Tanya Troutman, uh, for their assistance, as well as uh, Chair Soderberg, Greg Thal, and Alan Flanagan, all of whom also served on the selection committee. Uh, their assistance in navigating the complex RFP process was invaluable, and I appreciate it very much. Uh, are there any questions uh, related to the actuarial services contract? Okay, uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, it's an item that's not on your agenda. Uh, I want to recognize a key member of my staff who is retiring on June 18th, uh, Dave Tarsi, uh, as the Deputy Director of the Office of Member and Participant Services. He oversees retirement counseling in all of our regional field offices. He's been with SERS for over 20 years, and he's had a tremendous impact on our high level of customer service and, quite frankly, on the lives of countless active and retired members, participants, and their family members. Uh, he's been my right arm for over 20 years, and he's going to be sorely missed. And uh, with Chair Soderbergh's permission, um, I'm asking that this recognition be added to the committee report and the minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, my very best wishes to Dave, Dave Tarsi. Um, over 20 years with SERS, and I believe his last day is next week, correct? That's correct. We're so, June 18th. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So please please give Dave our congratulations and best wishes for his, his retirement. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Uh, the uh, 
The only remaining item on the agenda is just some informational items that have been attached in board docs for your review. Any uh, comments or questions uh, before we have the motion to adjourn? Mary, can I just make a comment in regards to the next, the plan for the next meeting? Yes, please do. Okay. So um, we brought in Callan and Corn Ferry to do their board education today regarding the overview of assumed rate of return and actuarial assumptions and their relationship to the capital market expectations. Uh, we'll be planning to bring to bring them back in July. Um, the meeting is either July 27th or 28th with the plan that we'll further discuss this and potentially maybe ask for um, from some discussion at the committee level to um, evaluate whether we would want to change the assumed rate of return for the upcoming actuarial evaluation with the measurement date of December 31st, 2021. Right. So if um, joint between now and then, if anybody reviews the material and has any questions or would like a different um, additional information, please don't hesitate to reach out to Mary or myself or Joe Torda or the investment office, and we can try to put you in touch with the, the right people to get you the best information that you can so you can make an informed decision in July. Thank, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. All right. A, a motion is in order to approve. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, may I have a motion for adjournment, please? So moved. Second. Need a second? Second, this is Alan. Thank you. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 The motion is approved. The committee meeting of the Finance and Member Services Committee is now adjourned. We will be moving on to the Board Governance and Personnel Committee meeting at um, 2.50. 250. All right. Thank you very much.